This morning, uh, as I mentioned, we are starting a new sermon series called The Gifts of Christmas. And it is actually a sermon series that was developed by a, a group called the Skit Guys. Now, I've played a couple of their videos from time to time. Uh, and in this particular series, each of the sermons, each of the messages is preceded by a short video. And so uh, this morning, following our second scripture, uh, we'll turn down the lights so that you can take a look at the video. And I think you will find it to be insightful as well as entertaining. So this morning, I am continuing the story that Carolyn uh, shared with us from Luke 2. I'm starting with verse 8, and it is the, uh, the story of the shepherds in the field. And there were shepherds living out in the field nearby, watching, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of, of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all of the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. See this box? This is a gift for the whole family. You see, we are a Christmas decorations right after Thanksgiving dinner type of family. As soon as the stuffing is in the Tupperware, boom, we are setting out ornaments and lights. And truth be told, the lights stay out till mid-January at a minimum. Now, that may be because we just love the Christmas atmosphere and the Christmas spirit, or we're just lazy. I mean, we were devoted to the tradition of it, to the routine of it. I think in our hearts we just got lazy. We have this tradition where every Christmas we would all set up the nativity scene and we'd set it out diligently, routinely. It was almost as if we were just trying to get through that next hurdle so we could watch our Christmas movies. So I had this idea. That's right. I stole baby Jesus. I plucked him right out of there. I started doing this about four years ago. I wanted him to mean something when he was in the manger. Now I know what you're thinking. What? Why would a sane man hide the baby Jesus during Christmas? And I think therein lies the problem. A, I'm not that sane. And B, for me, Jesus was becoming just another ornament. And I just didn't want him to be that anymore. I wish you could have been there that very first year. It was Bedlam. Where's baby Jesus? Who took him? <laughs> the mystery of baby Jesus' whereabouts was on the forefront of everyone's minds. And then before you know it, I started throwing out these little ransom notes. And then people were, they were searching for clues. And, and every night at dinner table, they would come up with these new theories. In the kitchen. Mm, I think really? it's somewhere yeah. outside. I think he's somewhere in the living room. Yeah, but... For three weeks straight, our house was cloaked in conspiracy. I wonder where he is. Me too. Me three. Me four. I did it! Now, I may not be the brightest bulb on the Christmas tree, but I do know, and I was raised to know, that the most important thing about Christmas is to seek Christ. 
And that's why I hide the baby Jesus. My kids, they've gotten so into this. Two years ago, they made shirts that said, uh, keep calm and find Jesus. And last year, last year they made a Facebook and they posted everything on it. <laughs> you wanna know where I hid baby Jesus this year? I hid him in our flower bed. Yep, gave him a little ransom note. Their last clue was this, Ephesians 5.2. And walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The fragrant offering part kind of confused my little one. She kept trying to look for him in the bathroom. Anyway, it took them a while, but they finally found him. I still got it. So, I have to go back out and hide him again. Because we will not open this gift until Christmas Eve. And then on Christmas Eve, we'll turn off the phones and the TVs. And I'll just be quiet. He came into the world quietly. And I just want my family to absorb this. And then we will open up this gift, this amazing God-breathed, prophecy-filled gift. And we will sit around as a family and we will talk about why Jesus was the greatest Christmas gift ever. Hiding baby Jesus. <laughs> You know, friends, the Friday after Thanksgiving is commonly known as Black Friday, and it has become the official beginning of the holiday shopping season. But this year, as has been the case for several years now, some stores started offering Black Friday deals as early as Thanksgiving Day, even the Wednesday before. Now, I have never gone Black Friday shopping. Uh, I didn't do it this year, I didn't do it the previous year, and I don't intend to ever. But I know a lot of people who have, and they, to, truth be told, they have gotten a number of really good deals. But I think part of the reason why I have avoided going shopping on Black Friday is not because I don't want to get a good deal. It's deeper than that. To me, Black Friday is a reminder of the way that Christmas has become like any other holiday. Because every holiday throughout the year, 4th of July, Memorial Day, Veterans Day, Labor Day, they are usually accompanied by what? A sale. Which takes away the fact that they're special. Holidays have become ordinary days. And Black Friday, along with its offspring, Small Business Saturday and Cyber Monday, have made Christmas ordinary, just like any other day. And you know, that's what Eddie, the dad in the video, was trying to avoid with his family. He didn't want Christmas to become ordinary, and that is exactly what had happened for him and his family. And Jesus, the reason for celebrating Christmas in the first place, had become just another ornament, nothing special. But Jesus is special, isn't he? He was sent by God to change the world, to save us from ourselves, to save us from being ordinary. And I think that is what expectancy or expectation is all about. It's defined as the state of thinking or hoping that something, especially something pleasant, will happen or be the case. When we wait with expectancy, it implies a kind of excitement, a kind of anticipation that something really cool is about to happen. 
We saw it in Eddie's children as they tried to figure out where the baby Jesus was hidden. And we heard it in their joyful shrieks when they finally found him in his secret hiding place. The excitement that goes along with the spirit of expectancy, I believe, is something that we need to rekindle. Because quite frankly, for a lot of us, Christmas has become just another obligation. I remember one of the first Christmases we spent here in Arizona. Ryan was in elementary school and Erica was a toddler. Well, she wanted a playhouse for Christmas. And her birthday is on January 3rd, right after Christmas. So we thought, okay, we could combine Christmas and her birthday and not only get the playhouse, but also furnish it with all the necessary, you know, stuff. Well, let me tell you trying to find all of those pieces to go inside the playhouse, the refrigerator, the stove, the table, the little microwave, trying to find all those things. I can't tell you how many toy stores I went to because truth be told, I'm a bit of a last minute shopper. And I can't tell you how stressful that time was. By the time Christmas came around, I was exhausted, so exhausted that on Christmas Day, I don't even remember feeling very much joy. I felt like I'd lost the wonder and the mystery of the season, the wonder and mystery of Christ's Mass, the wonder and mystery of Jesus' birth. And you know, I think that that sense of wonder and excitement that I'm talking about is exactly what the shepherds felt that night when they saw the angel. Yes, the shepherds were ordinary people. In fact, they were less than ordinary. Shepherds were considered lower class in Jesus' day, along with tax collectors and dung sweepers. But it hadn't always been that way. There was a time when being a shepherd was a noble occupation. And, but as farming and, and other occupations became more popular and more desirable, being a shepherd lost its appeal. In fact, by the first century, shepherds and their sheep were considered filthy. And yet... They were the first to be chosen by God to be informed of and to discover God's greatest gift to humanity. Don't be afraid, the angel said. I bring you good news. The Messiah, the anointed one, is born in Bethlehem. You'll find him wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. You'll find him. That was an invitation to the shepherds to go to Bethlehem and look for the child. It's no wonder they picked up everything they had and hightailed it to Bethlehem right after that. They were filled with expectancy, that sense of expectation that they were about to be witnesses to something absolutely amazing. And you know, I think that's the way it should be for us every Advent season. As Christmas approaches, we should approach it with excitement. The excitement of expectation that the coming of Christ is meant to bring. And you know, there was a time when I was a child that I felt that sense of expectation. Growing up in California, I remember feeling that sense of expectation It started every year in August because that was when my mother started buying Christmas gifts. And she wasn't like normal moms who would just hide the Christmas gifts in the cupboard. Oh, no. She would wrap them and place them on the sofa bed in her sewing room in plain view of all of us. I know. So from August until after Thanksgiving, when we would finally put up the tree, those gifts sat there wrapped. Of course,
course, they were unlabeled, so we didn't know which gifts were for whom or what was inside of them. And so I spent months trying to figure out, A, whose gifts were for which person and what was actually inside of them. So that by the time Christmas Day come, I came along, I was about to explode with excitement. But you know, even though my mom's Christmas shopping habits drove me crazy every year, Christmas was fun when I was a kid. But when I became an adult, like many of us, it became more of an obligation. All the grown-ups, all of you grown-ups out there probably know what I'm talking about. Because after all, there are a lot of things that we grown-ups have to do in order to prepare for Christmas. There are the Christmas cards to write, and the Christmas gifts to buy and wrap. There's the house to be decorated. The Christmas dinner needs to be planned. There are all the Christmas parties to go to, and then there's all that cleaning. Oh my gosh, we have to clean the house before the guests come, and then after the guests leave, and in between we have lots and lots of cleaning to go on. It can be just one obligation after another. Obligations that it distract us from the feeling of excitement that we should be feeling as we wait for the birth of a king. So, what if we turned Christmas upside down this year, just like Eddie did for his wife and his kids? What if we took the baby Jesus out of the nativity and didn't bring him back again until Christmas Eve. You see, I think Eddie's game is very symbolic because it put the mystery back into the birth of Christ. When Jesus was born, he was unexpected. The people living in Palestine didn't look at their calendars and say, oh, look, the Messiah is going to be born in less than a month. Let's decorate our houses and send cards to everyone. Let's plan a gigantic feast and invite all of our friends and let's go shopping and buy gifts for the people we love. Oh, there's so much to do. We better get going. I'm sure there's a sale someplace. No, they didn't say that. Because when Jesus was born, it was without fanfare, without anybody really knowing it, except for his mother and his earthly father. A young woman, probably a teenager, and her husband-to-be, who was a carpenter, a laborer, not a king or a prince, but a common man with a common family. And after Jesus was born, who were first to be informed? The shepherds, the lowest of the low. And when the shepherds came to see Jesus, they didn't bring gifts fit for a king. They brought themselves and their sheep so they could see this thing, this wonderful, magical, mysterious thing that the Lord had told them about. Now, don't get me wrong, I am not suggesting that we stop going to Christmas parties or that we stop decorating our houses or we stop sending Christmas cards or giving gifts to our loved ones. I'm suggesting we put Christmas back into perspective and we rekindle that excitement and sense of expectancy that we had as children that instead of focusing on what a great deal we can get on the biggest and brightest and best TV there is, that we focus instead on the mysterious, unexpected, filled with wonder birth of Christ. And perhaps one way we do that is by hiding baby Jesus by setting up our nativity scenes at home without the baby Jesus, just like I've done right here today. You see, I have hidden baby Jesus, just like Eddie did for his kids. And on Christmas Eve, I will bring him out and I will put him back in his rightful place with his mother and his earthly father. And you know, I just might even give you clues each week as to where I have hidden him but you'll have to come to worship on Sundays to find out. Because I think that the most important thing about Christmas 
is seeking Christ, just like Eddie said in the video. And seeking him in a way that brings excitement and expectancy back into our lives. So, let's change the way we approach Christmas this year by giving each other the gift of expectancy. Amen.